turn things over to Don Tamaki to say a few words on behalf of the family. Don is a partner at Minami Tamaki LLP, and he's also the nephew of Thomas Yamashita. Please welcome Don Tamaki. Thank you, Deborah. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on behalf of uh, Tom Yamashita and, and his family. Um, Bob Yamashita was supposed to be here, his son, to do this introduction, but uh, I'm, a, I'm your stand-in for today, so thank you. Um, just a couple things about Tom, um, and within the context of today's presidential elections, where there's so much talk about rounding up of immigrants and uh, by Donald Trump and um, Ted Cruz saying we have, to, we have to surveil and secure Muslim neighborhoods, whatever that means. Um, probably a, a, one of the key defining events of Tom Yamashita and his generation was the internment of nearly 120,000 uh, Americans, 70,000 people who were born in this country, citizens. So uh, Tom and our family, families of Americans of Japanese ancestry, certainly understood what it means to, uh, what a rounding up looks like. And I, th I think that um, spurred really the formation of this uh, modest uh, but important uh, award that he uh, and his family has in doubt. Um, I want to give you a little bit about, about the background of the committee's uh, selection process. I mean, each year we get fantastic applications. And so the question is how you distinguish one, for the, one from another, which ones uh, rise to the level of being the awardee and, and worthy of the prize. And you know, this is not a, a big monetary re reward, but we take it very seriously. And um, we hope that it is a important resume point to uh, the prize winner and also uh, spurs them and encourages them to keep on doing what they're doing. So the topic of the award is social change. And um, the committee does a really a pretty rigorous back and forth among each other. And uh, there are many people who start out with wonderful um, thesis propositions in, in academia. And all, they're all excellent and worthy and interesting. But the ones that get, have gotten uh, sort of to the next round are those who then take that and become let's say a convener, someone that meets and begins to spread and discuss you know, their, their uh, thesis topic and their theories. And then there are those who rise to a level further and become teachers. They bring that to academia. It becomes a further topic of discussion and development. And then the next level of people uh, rises to the level of, of uh, thought leader. You know, leading proponents of what they are doing. And to get even higher than that, they become implementers. And that is to say they go out in the real world and they test their theory and they act on them. And then if that, those projects are successful, uh, that, you know, if you be, then you become a change agent, which is like the home run of the holy grail, I think, of what uh, dissecting in our own simple way what social change really means. And so in reviewing the um, award application of Eileen uh, Cesara, we were very impressed with uh, that. And among many, many uh, qualified and excellent applications, her stood out. So uh, I want to send our congratulations to the family. Uh, welcome friends, uh, Professor Savoy. I'm looking forward to your talk. And uh, glad you're all here. Thank you for spending the time to uh, be a part of this important event. Thank you, Don. Um, so now, uh, as you know, this year's award winner is Eileen Suzara, and she was nominated by Rosalie Z. Fenchel, who's the program manager of the Berkeley Food Institute. And Rosalie's going to say a few words about Eileen. And uh, Rosalie, you can stand wherever you want. You can, you can be at the podium. I think that mic is now on as well. Or what, what would you prefer? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I can't wait to hear this. You 
wearing. <laughs> <laughs> the small one, that's what I picked. Um, thanks so much for joining to celebrate Eileen today. Um, Deva just reminded me that I wrote three single spaced size 10.5 font pages about Eileen when I um, submitted the nomination letter. So I tried to just make a little excerpt from that and what I wanted to say um, about Eileen today. Um, and I'm going to focus on the part about what she did here on campus because I'll be followed by Marie Rose Tuluk who will be talking about her work in the community. So I'm just gonna highlight some of the amazing things that Eileen did while a student here. Um, so it's with great joy that I get to introduce Eileen who's both a colleague and a friend and I'm so happy that she's um, won the 2016 Yamashita Prize. Um, I had the honor of working with Eileen at the Berkeley Food Institute for a year. I was her supervisor while she was a graduate student researcher um, at the Food Institute. The Berkeley Food Institute is a research center here on campus. Um, we're dedicated to empowering new food and agricultural leaders with capacities to cultivate diversity, justice, resilience, and health in food systems. And at the time that we um, started working with Eileen, we are looking for someone to really expand our community engagement program. And there couldn't have been a better person to do that than Eileen, um, I feel like Eileen's entire worldview is engaged collective citizenship and she kind of quickly put this worldview to use at the Berkeley Food Institute. Um, her task on paper was actually a pretty modest one. We had just launched the new food systems minor at UC Berkeley, um, which is now just a shout out to the undergraduate minor. It's just finished its first year and I found out this morning we have 45 people doing the minor so far. So that's kind of an amazing success in one year. But um, part of the minor is a community engagement learning project. And so Eileen was tasked with kind of really gathering a network of organizations that could um, host students in the minor. But she said, okay, yeah, that's cool, I can do that. But she decided to do three other kind of big major projects while working at BFI that were all instigated um, by her. One is that um, she founded a fellowship, a community engagement fellowship program for graduate students. Um, that um, as a, a student in the School of Public Health, she and many of her colleagues um, are required to do a summer internship as part of the programming. Many of the master's programs here on campus have that. But um, to encourage students to be able to do more work in food and agriculture, she instigated and launched a new prog um, program through BFI where we support graduate students um, to do um, summer internships um, with food and agriculture related organizations. And what was so great kind of about Eileen's view on this is that yes there's lots of great organizations doing great work but the organizations that are working specifically with marginalized communities or students themselves who don't come from big financial means often can't do the kinds of internships that are the most meaningful so we set up this program to kind of specifically address that issue we've had five fellows go through the program so far all doing amazing work kind of everything from looking at food waste to redesigning food systems in long beach and we're excited that to be entering the third year of the program this year that wouldn't have started without Eileen. Um, another thing that Eileen did is she created a weekly newsletter of student opportunities. I can see a bunch of people in this room that I know have signed up for this newsletter. Um, we now have over 750 people that get this every week. It's basically an easy to read digest of like all food and agriculture related opportunities, um, jobs and internships. Um, and yeah, um, over 50 organizations have gotten amazing students as a result of this newsletter. It seems like a small thing, but something like this didn't exist. And I keep hearing both from students and from community members how amazing it is to be working together and that all of that keeps coming back that they got this from this newsletter that Eileen launched. So thank you <laughs> for making that service. Um, the third thing I want to highlight that Eileen did is um, she really turned a reflective lens on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion here um, on the UC Berkeley campus, looking at who studies food on this campus. And she recognized um, and named that folks involved in food and ag studies at UC Berkeley don't necessarily re represent a kind of broader diversity within the UC Berkeley community and also the larger community that's most affected by a lot of the biggest problems in our food system. So Eileen um, 
and myself and several other people on campus worked to get a grant from the Division of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion to focus specifically on um, and looking at, at these issues within food system studies at UC Berkeley. Um, she drafted the grant, we got the grant. It's, we're now in the second year of the program. It's been an amazing program. Um, Eileen's kind of returned to it in different ways throughout, even once she's graduated. Um, we're currently working on making a big kind of landscape map of the UC Berkeley food system that's going to be an amazing tool. But again, we couldn't have done this effort without Eileen behind the scenes. Um, which I guess all of these projects, what I'm really highlighting about Eileen is that it's a time that she recognized a resource gap and drew upon her wealth of experience in community-engaged learning and program development, and then kind of put that through her social justice lens to create really impactful new initiatives. And in each of these cases, she did it very humbly behind the scenes. This is not times when Eileen was like kind of out in front of the camera, but um, she's, I think that my understanding is that she sees the cultivation of an environment that encourages others to develop as engaged leaders, as real measurements of success. And that's something I admire very much about Eileen. I um, also want to say that she's an incredible public speaker, and um, <laughs> she's looking nervous that she's about to speak. But she's also, she's a front lines teacher too. Not all of her work is behind the scenes. And I think it's this rare combination of like subtle and charismatic leadership skills that makes her such a good match for the Yamashita Prize. So I do want to end with um, one example of one of the times I've been personally affected by her as a public speaker. Um, after she graduated with her master's in public health in May 2015, um, she came back to campus in October. Um, the Food Institute and a bunch of other organizations held this great public event called Decolonizing Food Ways where we are really looking at what it means to liberate our diets from colonial relationships of production and consumption. And Eileen was one of our chefs for the event. Um, so not only did she kind of whip up an amazing Filipino meal for 120 people with five student volunteers and a couple of hours, but she also um, kind of spoke to the meaning of what, what her meal was in relation to this topic. and. Um, she told the story that still affects me when I was looking at it this point I started to cry, so hopefully I won't cry when I talk about it now. But um, it had been the, oh see, I am gonna cry. <laughs> it'd been the 50th anniversary of the Delano grape strike last year. It's now the 51st anniversary this month. And um, she had put grapes on each plate and kind of referenced that, you know, said, look, there's grapes on your plate. You might overlook them because it looks like just like a basic colonial feast, you know, like, oh, this pretty decoration, but she kind of brought that to the history point of talking about um, the Delano Great Strike and the, um, the kind of hidden history of Larry Itliong and the other Filipino Americans, Manongs, who were um, kind of really started the strike and then reached out and worked with Cesar Chavez and other Chicano workers to form this United Fund that became the United Farm Workers. And it was through her storytelling and this kind of placement <laughs> of food and us all sharing it together that she really kind of told that powerful story. So I feel like that's really an example of Eileen as an educator and social change activist, um, that she uses the tools of storytelling and community prepared and community shared feasts to really bring folks on a personal journey to action. Um, Eileen is a fire starter and she's one of those rare people that um, through charisma and creativity can gather together really strategic thinkers and players, instigate action, and then just kind of step back when she's confident that the project is running and go on and do her next amazing thing. So thank you, Eileen. I'll now turn it over to Marie Rose to <laughs> talk about Eileen's community work. Um, it's so wonderful to be here and to get to celebrate the, the amazing and wonderful Eileen Suzara. Um, I, I am taking after her leadership on the, on the FACES board, the Filipino American Coalition for Environmental Solidarity. When I first joined FACES, Eileen, in her, her even younger youth, um, was the <laughs> um, took on the chairwomanship of, of FACES, um, and in, in that, um, uh, she, she helped transition this founding board of, of multi-generational folks and took it on as a youthful 
um, person and said, I can do this. And it's, it's that, that big spirit of Eileen that has, has carried on through the organization. And, and our small volunteer organization of FACES is small but mighty. We've, we've taken on the US military on their toxics legacy in the Philippines. We've taken on the Chevron Corporation and their toxic legacy in the Philippines. And now we're taking on the small campaign of climate change as it affects the Philippines. And through that, I think the, the big spirit of Eileen, I'm going to tell you a few stories about those campaigns that, that will show you uh, Eileen's big spirit and, and why she is so deserving of this prize and more. Um, uh, one of my first stories, so uh, when I first joined, um, Eileen had, had ushered in um, a new campaign to take on the Chevron oil um, company that uh, was part of this, this oil depot in, in Manila, in Pandacan. And imagine um, oil tanks as big as a stage and dozens of them that are next to um, homes and, and schools in the Philippines and um, faces partnered with a local organization, um, Advocates for Environmental and Social Justice. And, and Eileen um, was part of the, the campaign that was helping to figure out how we would take on these oil giants and um, make them move. <laughs> um, so ma imagine that, T tanks as big as a stage um, littering the neighborhood and, and Eileen helping to figure out how we were going to do that. And one of the trips that we took to the Philippines that Eileen and I got to be on was um, was a field trip to where the pipeline started in the southern part of the island, and um, we were visiting <laughs> we were visiting um, an oil terminal, and they also had an oil ref an old oil refinery, and um, we were trying to figure out what was going on there, and so um, we had a, we had a driver and us in the car, and we were searching out what was happening inside this, this oil terminal, and here comes the security coming after us. So we had, to, we had to do a getaway, and it happened that the getaway, this, this is a totally family campaign, the getaway driver was her dad. <laughs> And so it's just like this, the, the, the spirit of Eileen in this campaign is so much about um, family and making sure family and community are all right. And so we're also celebrating um, uh, the, the victory of that Pandakan campaign against the oil depots. As, uh, as of last year, the, the local organization was able to get the oil depots to move out three major oil companies and one of our members actually was there in December and showed us pictures of these giant oil tanks and the walls of them torn down and on the ground. And Eileen was instrumental in making sure that that campaign was successful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so when we pivoted um, to a climate change campaign, as we were seeing Typhoon Haiyan lash um, the central Philippines, um, we said we needed to do something about that. And, um, and so there was obviously the support that we needed to, to lend to our, um, our sisters and brothers and families in the Philippines. And then we also thought there has to be something done here in the U.S., in the Filipino-American community in the Bay Area. And one of our, our, our sister organizations, the Filipino Advocates for Justice, um, and their youth program in Union City, uh, lots of Filipinos in Union City, they had wanted forever, they had a dream also of, of setting up a community garden next to their office. And Eileen, like, her spirit like glowed and she's like, that's my dream too. And let me help make this happen. And so the Bahay Kubo Garden, which Eileen, um, spearheaded for FACES and with the Filipino Advocates for Justice is, is a testament to her, um, her, her big spirit, her commitment, the, the ease that um, she does uh, her work with and, and that, you know, getting her amazing master's degree from Berkeley and, um, you know, for, and her, her food experience and her, her land experience from Santa Cruz and Pie Ranch and all the places that we've followed you. 
<laughs> she, she brings it to the youth of uh, Filipino youth in Union City for this Baha'i Kubo garden. And, um, and on top of that, of course, she um, not only keeps her, her skills and, um, and love of food to herself, she has to share um, that, not just feeding us, but I think, you know, that the, the aspect of social justice work is to make sure it spreads. And so I am the, the humble recipient of Eileen's brilliance um, through my 12-year-old son, who's part of the Sama Sama Cooperative. It's a Filipino summer camp that is, was now in its third year. And Eileen is head chef at Sama Sama Camp in the summer. And as, as if, uh, here in the U.S. is a busy mom and many busy moms who are actually former FACES um, board members in Sama Sama, um, it's hard for us to show our kids how to cook Filipino food. But Chef Eileen, Auntie Eileen, every day showed our kids how to make Filipino food. And so now my son will tell me about Filipino dishes that I have never had because Auntie Eileen showed him how. And so with, um, with that spirit, um, and Eileen's love of community and love of land and love of justice. Um, I'm, we're so proud of you from FACES to be receiving this prize. <laughs> and now at long last, I'd like to call Eileen up to receive her award. <laughs> I told myself, I also told my fiance here that I definitely wouldn't cry today because today's a celebration and it's Halloween, but definitely feel the, the tears welling up inside um, just from the fullness of what's here. So everyone, mabuhay, oh shoot, um, mab <laughs> unedited, um, mabuhay, can you hear you guys say that back to me? Mabuhay. mabuhay. Let's do that one more time. All right, we're, get, we're warming up. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have a good one at the end. But just thank you so much. Thank you so much for gathering here today. Thank you so much to the family that has put so much of their care and intention behind this, this award, um, for the organizing committee, um, for Rosalie and for Mary Rose for coming up and sharing your words and your stories, um, all these warm words. I'm not sure that I can be charismatic right now because my heart is fluttering so fast and I <laughs> just... Um, but I just want to extend that, that gratitude. Um, being here with all of you is, is such an incredible honor. Um, I know standing here, it's standing with all of those, even those who aren't in the room right now. I know I'm here with uh, the support and love of so many teachers and mentors and friends and family. Um, and in this very room are role models that I look up to um, and who work so fiercely for health and justice and for equity. And so I'm so proud to be here with our vibrant community um, who grows our leadership together. So, so what's been amazing, uh, I, I'll try not to spend too much time on this, but I've realized that so many interlapping, uh, overlapping uh, circles of people have come together in this room right now. So just wanna, got, wanna see who's in the room. Uh, raise your hand if you came here today from somewhere around UC Berkeley. Maybe your staff or faculty or students. All right, Berkeley, you're here. Uh, <laughs> raise your hand if you came from elsewhere in the Bay Area today to be here. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you came from somewhere else in California that's not in the Bay. Raise your hand if you came today from Michigan. Michigan. <laughs> Come on. Okay, there's one in the front. I knew it. I, I, I specifically planted that, that in here. Um, we, have <laughs> we, have, we have, raise your hand if you went to Mount Holyoke at some point. All right, there we go. So, so I'll, I'll call out Lorette more, more when, when we get there, but I just want to, to recognize how many circles of people have come here together in the room, and I hope that you get a chance to, to meet each other and talk. Uh, oh yeah, and from the Philippines. Oh my gosh, Shana, so our farthest, our farthest person here today. Um, so, you know, while I was reflecting on, on just what to, to say and, and what to bring here today, um, I started just having some words that came to mind over and over again, and they were just land, culture, health. Land, culture, and health. And 
I think to me that's been kind of the guiding force between deciding what to do next and, and where to work. But I also believe it's, it's something that brings us all here together today as well in, in whatever work that we happen to be doing. Um, I guess I'm someone who works kind of at the intersection of food and land. And there's something, a really important ingredient to all of that that I want to share here today. And, and that is the power of stories um, to heal and to transform. And I think that when we are able to tell stories of our culture, to really hear uh, the voices and realities of people um, who are most impacted uh, by the issues we see today, when we're able to celebrate those cultures, then we're really able to, to find our power to heal. Um, as someone who works in food, um, and someone, who, you know, I was here somewhat recently uh, finishing an MPH in nutrition. Um, I learned how to tell a story about food and health in a different way. Um, but what I want to share here is that no matter what, I think we can all relate that food, what food really is, it, it is so closely tied to social justice. Um, it's more than calories. It's more than nutrients. It's more than a source of disease. It's even more than sustenance. It's even more than a reflection of inequity or access. I think food is intrinsic to the stories that we want to carry forward into the world and our connection to the land and that reciprocity that we have between the health of the land and the health of our own people. So I want to share, so you've been staring at a, a picture of a very small person uh, for a while. So I just want to share a little bit of my family's story about food. Um, I think, you know, in, in sharing something personal, I, I know that um, when I think when we tap into some of our personal stories, that's when we can also unlock something bigger to really relate and connect across communities in, in a more authentic way. Um, but for my family, my mom is from, the, my parents are both from the Philippines. Uh, my mom is from Pangasinan, which is the land of salt, um, literally. And my dad is from Bicol, which is a place full of chilies and coconuts. And both of them, when I, when I talk to them, I ask them for their stories to remember food and land and what, what their childhood memories were. They remember, they remember abundance. Um, they remember eating, you know, wild ferns and coconut milk and fresh fish in the rivers. Um, together, they also had this diversity and abundance in their own life and culture. They spoke five languages collectively. Um, all the, you know, Philippines is 7,000 islands, for those of you who might not be as familiar, and so many languages there. Um, and then they migrated in the 60s. So when I was born, I'm the, the smaller one on the right, that's my sister, my older sister, Aiden, on the left. When I was born, I grew up uh, the child of the 80s, and I was a child of spam and Vienna sausages and uh, microwave meals, TV dinners, and, and so much pressure to assimilate in schools. Um, I grew up speaking only English. Uh, that was something that had been told to my parents uh, when they migrated to, to not teach us our own original language. Um, and, you know, I think there's kind of a, I understand now that they did what they, they had to do. That was a survival tactic, but it's something that we've, we've learned, you know, that doesn't need to be done anymore. Um, but as a young person, I remember really searching how to reconnect, living so far away from the land of our ancestors. How do you reconnect in a really authentic way? And for me, food was, was the beginning of that. And when I was able to unlock a connection to cultural foods, um, made through exploring, like there was one cookbook that my mom had brought uh, from the Philippines in the 60s that was full of Filipino recipes. That one cookbook and asking these questions to my family, that was un unlocking into what, what ended up becoming a lifelong affair with understanding a connection between food and who my family was, and in essence, what was our relationship to place. So here uh, on the left, just want to share some images from my parents' uh, province in the Philippines, um, some of the rice fields there. And there on the right, this was, this was a time when everything changed. So I was eight years old there. I met my, my grandfather for the first time. Um, he introduced us to green mangoes. And, um, and what I learned later from him was that he was our last kind of living linkage to our agrarian past in our family. And he was a, a farmer before World War II hit the Philippines and, and turned that pathway uh, towards, you know, he joined the military and became a pilot instead, um, but still continued to love food. So I guess where I want to go from there is just to share that over the years, you know, as a, as a second generation Filipino American um, who had been activated, as Mary Rose shared, uh, by the environmental justice movement, and yet still kind of held food in like a separate, it was in like my second heart. I had my first heart here, uh, focus on land-based work, and food was somewhere there. I began to try to find ways to really bridge the two and figure out how, how our communities, um, how we could be at that, uh, that overlap between those. 
And I decided to train as a farmer in my early 20s. I'm in the organic farming. Raise your hand if you hear grow food yourself in some capacity. All right, raise your hand if from another generation back, maybe you had more farm, farm roots there. Maybe if it's been two generations back from that. All right, so I wanted to just make an immediate connection um, in this generation. And what I found was as much as I, I loved I love the process of training in organic agriculture, agroecology specifically, the process of seeds and saving and how it seemed to be um, a step away from the extractive economy and all of these kind of harmful practices that were polluting the earth. Uh, but at the same time, I was like, why do I feel, uh, as a young person of color, kind of alienated within, within the good food movement? Why, why would it feel that way? It, it, it didn't make any sense. And it seemed to be that when I would walk into um, you know, different organic or sustainable food conferences or even open up curriculum, I could sometimes just count on one hand the number of brown or black people who were there with me in rooms sometimes of hundreds. Um, there was this missing piece. There was a, a sense of something that was a gap that needed to, to be told, a story that needed to be told. And all of that, I think, coming from a background in EJ, seeing frontline communities who were fighting for land and food and water, and then seeing this kind of the good food movement, um, and yet not seeing the bridging between that. That was really an impetus to try to bring those two together. I wanted to know where and how we could bring our stories of resiliency and leadership into these kinds of spaces. So I wanted to, I wanted to tribute the, the Filipino and Filipino-American farm worker history that's right here in California. Mary Rose, I love how you, you brought back and, and kind of conjured up um, the names of people who were involved with that. Rosalie, too. Uh, we, we are in a place that is rich in the stories and histories of people of color who have really built um, agriculture and food in this country. And yet, too often, we don't actually feel and hear the stories told. And now I'm just kind of going to pivot from that. Um, the, I think the stage has already been set into what Baha'i Kubo is. But I think in part of wanting to change the narrative and to kind of reclaim the voices and roles of folks of color, Filipino-Americans, of our, our collective strength, um, was how do we make it something tangible and something real and something immediate? And so this image with these beautiful faces um, are you know, some of the, the young people from uh, Filipino Advocates for Justice, who I just really want to shout out here. They've been around for how long? 40? 40 plus years, 40 plus years. And incidentally, some of the founders, you know, back in the day, they had founded and, and really continued to work after some of them had gone to UC Berkeley, actually, and continued to, to recognize this gap, this need, and just continue to work. And they've, they do amazing, um, you know, direct service and organizing within the Filipino American community. And after this linkage that was made between faces, Mary Rose played such a bridge role in connecting with Filipino advocates for justice and their youth in Union City. Uh, we decided to converge everything that we cared about, land, food, health, climate, um, and to build this demonstration garden, which is Baha'i Kubo. Okay, a lot of words are going to suddenly flash up on the screen, don't worry. All right, so I'm not going to actually sing right now because I want us to hear Lorette, <laughs> but this song um, you know, just in terms of bringing stories and culture to the fore of what we do. Uh, this song was actually one of the inspirations between how we want to structure and plan this garden. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen or heard this song before. Bye, Google. All right. So basically, it's a children's song, and um, it, was, it was actually the only thing I learned in Tagalog when I was that little girl there. I couldn't speak any free, oh no, I could say I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, and then I could sing this song. So those are, <laughs> those are the only things I could do. But this song, I think we kind of, we kind of settled on this as an inspiration point because it, it was a reminder that all these stories of, you know, whether we're talking about agricultural or cultural diversity, they're already rooted in our culture. We just have to reclaim that and unlock it and turn it into something that's gonna work here in our time. So we took this song, which is all about these delicious vegetables which can grow in even in a very humble setting. And we decide to turn it into a plan. And so the youth um, were gathered and they had their collective input. 
Um, what do you want to see grow? How do you want to see it grow? The land that we were on was actually, you'll see a little bit more in a bit, the land we were actually on um, is next to their office. Um, it's, it's small. It's, it's, it's not actually much more than a tenth of an acre, but it still means something. There aren't a lot of urban gardens in that area. And the land had formerly been a grocery way back in the day and then had just been kind of waiting, I think, for, for these youth to turn it into something alive. And that reflected who they were. So we took that, put it, turned it into a, a map, into a plan. This was submitted to Berkeley's Big Ideas Contest. And through some of you who are here today, um, was able to move forward and to actually place first and get the seed funding um, for the Food Systems Award through that. So that launched the garden. I think we have to thank um, so many people for that, the organizations, and also the recognition um, that you know, while we were applying kind of against different, more tech-based um, food system interventions, we were kind of showing that sometimes the biggest innovation of all is to reclaim roots and to reclaim culture as a way to move forward. Not everything has to be high tech. Somebody can be low tech and, and it can take us further. So the garden has continued to grow in Union City. Um, these are some of the amazing youth and neighbors and it is coming really rooted in Filipino American stories but also the broader community to find a place of welcome and connection and healing and resiliency. And Oops, oops. Even beyond that, we've actually, there, there have been uh, climate justice delegates from the Philippines who have visited California and actually come to the garden and speak there. So it's really become a place that's alive. It, it's so full of potential. And even, you know, it's something I think that holds the seed for so many other things to, to come out of. And I did want to share one more image to, to kind of share, share a little bit of what Mary Rose um, was speaking about, which is Sama Sama Cooperative. Um, so this is a, a camp that was founded by this incredible collective of families, many of whom are environmental justice activists or had been part of FACES and really recognize this need to, to instill a sense of groundedness through land and culture and identity and language, including a food-based component. So it's been my deepest honor to, to come in there as their chef, get to work with these amazing young people cooking things from scratch, as well as tying it to their bigger, uh, bigger picture questions. This past summer, their theme was uh, fire and resistance. And so the menu we devised together was looking at the ways that food could nourish movement building. These are with children too. So just keep that in mind. You got six-year-olds who are thinking about the movement. And so I think we're all in good hands knowing that these kids are doing these things. All right. So I guess just to, to transition, I think one of the, the most surreal things that is happening right now is that um, sitting in the front row, um, is one of my dearest mentors and friends and a teacher. Uh, back from when I was a tender, you know, 18-year-old who was shivering, you know, fresh from Hawaii and, and landed in Massachusetts and didn't know how to dress for the snow. And um, I, I came, I walked into an environmental studies class, not sure if I knew what to do there. Um, and Lorette, you know, had a question, posed a question to all of us that made me feel like I belonged there. And she asked, what is your family's environmental story? And every other, every other um, environmental class I'd ever taken was more focused on amazing things, the geology, hydrology, and all that. I believe in that. That's good stuff. But to be questioned, to ask, what is your, your personal narrative, your story, that made me think there was something bigger and that there was a place for people like me there. So I also want to want to dig out. So I, I'm proud of myself. I'm terrible at saving paperwork. This paper is from 2005 from Lorette's class, and it was called Urban Gardening, Growing Community, and it's all about um, the possibility of building self-determination within Filipino American communities through a community garden that could focus on ecological justice, affirm a sense of place, and transmit cultural knowledge across cultures. And this is just a, you know, a three and a half page paper, and where it said, good, good, um, why don't you do this? <laughs> and, so, and so in making, um, <laughs> in making the connections, I just want to you know, use that as a reminder that we never do any of this work alone. Like this is a collective garden, but, but even in a snowy classroom far away in Massachusetts, there is this amazing woman who made sure that people felt like they belonged. And that's exactly the kind of environment that we need to keep creating, whether here at Berkeley or anywhere we are, making sure people feel like they belong there and that all of their stories of resiliency
can really shine because that's what changes the world. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to welcome Lorette. I don't know if there's an official introduction, but before I walk out, while I have your attention, I want to invite everyone for more snacks. And um, uh, you can talk to Mary Rose and I after this, but please come. Uh, Faces is having a sweet 16 merienda. So imagine that you're going to learn how to make Filipino treats fresh from the land that also support climate stories. I don't know where else, who else is putting on this kind of event. So please come to that. That's November 12th. Yes, there you go. So thank you. And now um, let's welcome up the wonderful Lorette. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I should say that I had notes, but now based on what I've heard and everything that Eileen said, I think I need to throw them out the window. Uh, I, I do want to say how happy I am to be here and uh, hello to everyone. I am grateful to be able to honor Eileen, uh, this activist, this author, this creative woman, this gift. She has touched my life so deeply and I'll, I'll tell you more about that. But before I go on, I do want to thank Deborah Lustig and Cynthia Alvarez and everyone who has welcomed me uh, here to Berkeley. It's been wonderful, uh, truly wonderful. And I want to thank you for coming. So given that I know time is a little short, I'm not going to read or talk as long as I had planned. But still, it'll be good. Uh, or I hope it will be. Um, I, I do want to say that one of the, the benefits of being a teacher at a liberal arts college like Mount Holyoke is that I have a chance to work with not just amazing students, but amazing thought leaders who perhaps at the age of 17 and 18 don't believe that they're that, but they are. And there's Eileen is here, Jen is here, Tracy is here, there are other Mount Holyoke alumna here in this room, and I have to say to you, and I'll say it to everyone, I think the best thing about being a teacher is that you're also a student. Eileen has taught me as much, or if not more, than I've taught her, and the same applies to the other students, former students with whom I've worked. It's the reciprocity. It's the continuing. Uh, and the, the one other thing I do want to say about being a teacher, and for those of you who teach here at Berkeley or at, at any other place, from an elementary school on up, when a student goes on to the next level, that is graduates, sometimes I feel as if I'm the remedial student who's been left back. Uh, that they're going on to do things in life and, well, here I am. But what I really realize now is that that interchange, that the reciprocal relationship, it begins there, but it continues throughout your life. And Eileen, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. And the tears are here. So I also want to say that Eileen has been doing this work since the get-go, since she first arrived at Mount Holyoke College. And what she may not have told you is that she is an amazing writer. And at the time when she was a student, I was working on a collection of uh, essays by writers of color to essentially blow out the definition of nature writing. Because I had been told at a conference, or actually asked the question at an environmental conference called The Art of the Wild, and I was perhaps one of a handful of people of color there. Well, why is it that people of color don't care about nature? Um, but they didn't use the word people of color. They said minorities. Uh, and it went on from that. And of course, that's a ridiculous question. And I invited authors, everyone from Jamaica Kincaid, Joseph Bruchak, Nikki Finney, Kimiko Hahn, uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, David Mas Masumoto, Yusuf Komunyaka, the list goes on and on, to answer that question. And I also asked Eileen. And she contributed an essay about invoking the ancestors that between you and me is about the best in the book. And uh, I just noticed in Eileen's bag that she happened to have the book. 
So what I'd like to do before I get started is just to read the last few words of her essay to give you a sense of family and the significance of storytelling. No, you're, it's here. <laughs> okay. Okay, here it is. The landscape is a narrative, not a narrator, because it has no human voice. It speaks through and is brought into being through the human nature dialogue in our voices and in our perceptions, an internal geography which is in turn shaped by the exterior environment. We are simultaneously the creation of our environments and ancestors and the creators of our environments and our descendants. It is necessary to suspend any expectation for a definite truth and to approach with an open mind the varied frameworks and approaches that have been taken to interpret, interpret our environment. We can simultaneously inhabit multiple truths. Through this realization, it may be possible to forge a middle path, one that sees the immense power and frailty in human renderings of our environment. She wrote this at age 24. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And I have to say, this is just the beginning. Eileen asked me to speak more about story, about storytelling and the role of story in helping us understand not only our sense of who we are in place, but also how story and land nourish us, a food in another way. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about a book that Eileen and Jen helped me come to, because again, in that reciprocal relationship at, at that college, I was in conversation with them. The book is titled Trace, Memory, History, Race, and the American Landscape. And um, if it's all right to say, I also came out yesterday to uh, receive the American Book Award for this, and I'm just blown out of the water. <laughs> but I'm saying it because it's a collective effort. The book began in dialogue. It began in exchange. It began in these hard questions. Because the question I asked of Eileen is the question I've asked of myself. So really, the book began in a struggle to really come to terms with questions that haunted me since childhood questions that Eileen and I have talked about, questions such as this. If each of our lives is an instant, like a camera shutter that opens and then closes, what can we make of our place in the world for that single instant? And then over time, over generations of family, what do accumulated instants mean? The book grew to become a mosaic, a personal journeys and historical inquiry that crossed a continent in time. Going from the San Andreas Fault Zone, which I know you all know well here, um, to a South Carolina plantation. Moving from an island in Lake Superior where the stories of indigenous peoples there were appropriated and possessed by those who then claimed them as an native American literature. In this case, Henry Rose Schoolcraft and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. From that island 
to Indian Territory and the black towns that were established there after the Civil War in what is now Oklahoma. From national parks to burial grounds to the names that this country wears and the origins of each of these names. And from the U.S.-Mexico border and its beginnings to the U.S. Capitol and its beginnings. In all of these, Trace tries to grapple with a searing national history to understand the unvoiced presence of the past. Because the past lives in the present. It touches each of us. It touches us in what we think and do and in who we are. And it's important to understand how each of us is marked to then move forward. What I'd like to do, uh, again briefly, is to give you a sense of the book and give you a sense of the significance of story that Eileen mentioned. And I'm going to read a little that introduces you to why I think this work matters, not just to me, but as a journey for all of us. And then, because there's a little event that might be occurring next Tuesday that some of us might be thinking about, um, I'll take you to Washington, D.C. Has anyone lived in New England? Hands up. Have you been there in winter? Okay, all right. And have you braved the ice in winter? All right. For those who haven't, what I'm about to read is not stupid, or you might think it is, but uh, I'm here, so it wasn't entirely a bad idea. And it's called Thoughts on a Frozen Pond. In the dead of winter, I like to walk on water, held above liquid depths of a nearby lake by a vast frozen plain. This ice demands respect. I look again, listen again, attentive to any crack or yielding to my weight. And when the surface is more solid than a hardwood dance floor and much thicker, I venture far. Even then, I hear the gloop, a distant lurp, a muffled gloosh. Water undulates beneath ice and me. Sunlight appears to emanate from above and below on cloudless February days, rain through the crystalline lattice underfoot. With my eyes but inches from the surface, any sense of depth, of refracted distance, yields to a sense of motion arrested. Air bubbles halt in mid-ascent. White oak leaves descend as if on invisible steps suspended for one season above the lake bottom. The recent past lies beneath me in these marcescent leaves plucked and blown here by January's heavy winds. Inches away they are out of reach because I kneel within the next stratum. Thoughts of time's passage always come to mind on such walks. Thoughts of how memory of any form becomes inscribed in the land. The hills surrounding this lake and my home are worn remains of long vanished mountains. Glacial debris from the last ice age produces a rock crop in my garden each and every spring. Stone walls that two centuries ago bordered fields and pastures, now thread the dark heart of forests. Lauren Isley wrote in The Immense Journey that human beings are denied the dimension of time, so rooted are we in our particular now. 
we cannot in person step backward or forward from our circumscribed pinpoints. I cannot touch a leaf encased in ice, nor can I feel the calloused hands that once stacked these walls. Yet we make our lives among the relics and ruins of former times and former worlds. And each of us is, too, a landscape inscribed by memory and by loss. I've long felt estranged from time and place, uncertain of where home lies. My skin, my eyes, my hair recall the blood of three continents as paths of ancestors, free and enslaved Africans, colonists from Europe, and peoples indigenous to this land converge in me. But I've known little of them or their paths to my present. Though I've tracked long bygone moments on this continent from rocks and fossils, those remnants of deep time, the traces of a more intimate lineal past have been hidden or lost. Yet to live in this country is to be marked. Life marks, seen and unseen. We are marked by its unfolding history, whether we realize it or not. So from my circumscribed pinpoint, I must try to trace what has marked me. The way traverses many forms of memory and silence of a people as well as a single person. And because our lives take place among the shadows of unnumbered years, the journey crosses America and time. Come with me. We may find that home lies in remembering, in piecing together the fragments left, and in reconciling what it means to inhabit terrains of memory and to be one. Trace, noun, a way or path, a course of action, footprint or track, vestige of a former presence, an impression, a minute amount, a life mark. Trace, verb, to make one's way, to pace or step, to travel through, to discern, to mark or draw, to follow tracks or footprints, to pursue, to discover. So what I'd like to turn to now is uh, a place that will be on the news quite a bit next week. Um, it's on the news now. And just food for thought. Eileen spoke so much of not only our connections with land, our connections with the source of nourishment, our connections with ancestors, and how they're all threaded together. But I want you to think about, do you know the origin of the nation's capital? Does anyone know why Washington is where it is? And anyone? Take a shot. Why is, why is DC where it is? Anyone know? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Okay. What? I heard a whisper. <laughs> Was that you, Tracy? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. Shh. <laughs> okay. Does anyone else want to hazard a guess? You know that it followed its placement after New York City was the first national capital after the revolution and then Philadelphia. Uh, and Philadelphia could have remained the capital, but there was a reason. 
And the reason was due to an extractive economy, and Eileen mentioned this term, an extractive economy that was based not on the food that could be raised, but was based on how much money could be earned from the land. And raising food was not the reason for it. It was raising an export crop, and that export crop was tobacco. So the first few pages of placing Washington, D.C. after the last inauguration. I stand in the place my father's kin called home. Ancestors came because this river flows to an ocean across whose waters empires expanded and peoples migrated by choice and by force. They came here too because of a president's wish for a new capital. On every visit to Washington, D.C., I come to this river, the Potomac. From where I stay in Glover Park, a path follows Foundry Branch through woods of sycamore and beech, tulip poplar and oak to its mouth. I often walk this forested corridor within the city, at last passing through a dripping rock wall tunnel under the CNO Canal. Others know this spot, too. Some live here in warm weather, their makeshift shelters under canoping shade. But the moments when no one else is about, I take as gifts and linger at the river's edge. The Potomac's waters rise in Appalachian highlands far to the west. Tributary branches course along a trellis of mountain valleys and ridge gaps toward the rolling Piedmont. I stand downstream by the main channel near the farthest inland reach of the sea. Here, the Piedmont's crystalline bedrock cut by Foundry Branch, by Rock Creek, and by the river itself at Great Falls descends beneath the blanketing coastal plain. This is the fall line where a Piedmont River widens to become a tidewater arm of Chesapeake Bay. This is the head of navigation. The changing lay of land and water is clear. I like to watch the river flow through time at high tide and low, separating Maryland from Virginia. The Potomac has carried what some call the freight of history on its back. And I now know that I am part of that river's load. The paradox that is our nation's capital struck me as from a blow on January 20th, 2009. That day, nearly two million people gathered to witness Senator Barack Obama become the 44th president of the United States. My friend Chris and I were among them. Millions more watched the events on television, witnessed tradition and pageant, the oath of office taken on the Capitol steps, the new president's inaugural address, then the parade along Pennsylvania Avenue to the White House. Glimpses of monuments and memorials in downtown Washington may have been for many familiar reminders of national promise. We'd taken an early metro bus to Foggy Bottom that bright morning with the wind chill in the teens to walk with an expectant crowd to the National Mall. But this crowd differed in character and tone from all I'd known. Young parents carried toddlers in backpacks, elderly walked with youth, well-dressed affluence shared sidewalks with many more of poor means. Strangers nodded to and spoke to each other in kindness. And I overheard a young woman lean down to tell the child whose hand she held, remember this day and be proud of who you are. The children of nearly every nation and every continent stood together. 
It was then that I saw with a new clarity how Washington, D.C. is an invented place. For unlike capitals of most other nations, the district began far from the country's economic, intellectual, or cultural centers. Its origins arose instead from a political deal. The capital also harbored from its earliest days a secret city of free and enslaved Africans, the secret city my father's people inhabited from the start. Public history tends to present the founding of the nation's capital in these terms. The Constitution authorized a district of up to 10 miles square as the permanent seat of the new federal government. In July 1790, Congress passed the Residence Act, empowering President George Washington to choose a site along an 80-mile stretch of the Potomac River. And whether developed or not, the site would replace Philadelphia as capital in 1800. Yet public history often fails to mention the backstory, the why behind this geography. Put simply, the first president wanted the capital embedded in the South, not too distant from his Virginia plantation. It was inconvenient, if not difficult, for a president who depended on enslaved workers or any federal official in similar circumstances to live in his desired and accustomed manner in a region that was antagonistic to it. For with its Quaker heritage, Philadelphia was long known for abolitionist sentiments. And a new law automatically manumitted any slave brought into Pennsylvania for more than six months. The permanent home for the federal government in George, Washington, in George Washington's mind had to be located where slavery would and always remain unmolested. His vice president, John Adams, suggested that the value of the president's land had jumped a thousand percent with this sighting. He underestimated that. The first federal census in 1790 counted more than half of the new nation's nearly 700,000 souls held in bondage in just Maryland and Virginia and of free African Americans, many of whom had never been enslaved, more than one third in the nation lived in those two states. The nation's capital would be carved from both. My father's ancestors, my ancestors, have appeared on the scene by now. They may be part of the city's why, what, and how, and perhaps, They've been here much longer. That's all I'll read, but the, the point or one of the points I want to make is that when we think of how we use the land to grow, it has a long history, and some of that growing was based primarily or even solely on what could be gained financially. And Maryland and Virginia were the earliest places along the 13 colonies to establish tobacco agriculture as early as 1617. And it was a market for the English economy. So when we think of food, also think of what was grown that wasn't food, what was grown to support essentially the building of the American economy. Agriculture has always been key for good or for ill. But with that, coming back to what Eileen has done, what her colleagues have done, we know that foodways are part of our lives, they're part of our heritage, and they're part of our future. And turning from a sad note of the past, Let's turn to a happy note and celebrate this wonderful woman, Eileen Susara. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah.